Well, good to have you here. Happy New Year. It is January 2nd, which any other day I would probably say, oh, it's a great start to the week and we've got so much to tell you. But tonight, uh, I've got a bit of a countdown and I'm about one hour and 58 minutes to the end of the countdown. And during that countdown, I kind of think a big black book is going to drop. When I say a big black book, it's big, but it's little. It's Jeffrey Epstein's little black book. And the expectation is at this point that the judge in the case who has said, I'm going to release those names that have been basically held under seal since a civil suit. I'm going to release those January 1st, which was a holiday, meant today. And today ends in one hour and 58 minutes. So we're expecting at any moment we actually could get the drop of the little black book and those names. And there are so many people shaking in their boots. Like some of those people have actually taken to the civil action to try to get that to stop, get their names redacted. Why? Are they worried about something bad they did or are they worried they did nothing bad and everyone will think they did? There's so much at stake as the minutes literally count down. So I've got uh, a couple of things ahead in just a moment. Laura Engel standing by. She's actually got a team ready. Uh, that are just, they're just going to go through this at lightning speed to analyze it for you. That's all coming up in a moment. But I also have to tell you, like, th th there are social ramifications for this that are sort of reverberating. Aaron Rodgers kind of went after Jimmy Kimmel, suggesting he might be on the list. And Jimmy Kimmel's response was like, I mean, everything from calling him an a-hole to a soft-brained wacko and saying, if we have to debate this further, it's going to be in court. You know what that means? Defamation. So, ooh, it's big. Uh, all right, so all that's coming. And then also, you probably, if you're a true crime fan, like I am, are waiting with bated breath for the A&E special later this week. George and Cindy Anthony are taking lie detector tests on camera. So, little known secret, they already did it, and it's on tape, and the special is about to drop, but we have a preview of some of the questions and answers, and I've got to be honest with you, I didn't expect to see what I saw. I have my own theories about what happened in the Casey Anthony case, we'll share sometime soon, um, but I have my own theories about George, and when I saw the answer to one of the questions, I was a bit floored. And I'm really looking forward to hearing and seeing your reactions as well. That's coming up in just a few moments. It's been 15 years since that little girl's body, Kaylee, was found in the woods near their home. And they have been dogged by people who think they're involved and that they've lied all these years. So they, they kind of had it. And they've said, all right, hook me up. I'm willing to talk. So then the other thing I wanted to show you tonight, if you haven't already seen it and talk a little bit about it, is this thing that I didn't expect to see on Hollywood Boulevard. And that is this A-list actor from, uh, you know, Beverly Hills 90210. I used to love that show. Uh, Ian Ziering just got attacked by a mob of bikers and not just bikers, mini bikers. Have you seen these people? They, they ride like itty bitty bikes power motorbikes and like they can get off them and they just tip over in these nubs so they won't fall over but they they can tend to be really horrible like gangsta mob like on many bikes as it turns out uh ian Ziering, the red-headed famous guy from 90210 he found out the hard way how violent and cruel and evil and psychotic these people are so i'm going to show you the whole tape of what happened to him because they attacked him on the road then i'm going to show you what happened after as it turns out, his daughter, young daughter, was there for the, for the whole thing. All right, so all that is coming up ahead. And by the way, I'm really glad you're here. We're going to start this new year off great. Because uh, I just said it, new year, uh, new countdown. We could be moments away from the biggest drop to hit the headlines since the big shiny ball fell in Times Square just two nights ago. But this time, it's a document drop. And it's from the New York Federal Courthouse. And I know document is kind of a stuffy word, so let's just go ahead and call it what it is for most people. Jeffrey Epstein's little black book, document. Uh, last month, the judge ordered that um, it's got to it's gotta come out. He ordered the release of almost 200 names. Names of people who were linked either somehow uh, with Epstein or his accomplice, uh, Glenn Maxwell. Associates, maybe. Victims, maybe. 
um, socially, professionally, otherwise, all these connections. And the person who's got her finger on the pulse of this, because she's got all the connections at court, is Laura Engel. And she's here with me live now. So you just don't rest ever. You're just always <laughs> down there. And we work on it. And I'm ask you for drinks. You're like, sorry about the courthouse, talking to my sources. <laughs> but you get, the, you get the goods. True. And you found out that this is indeed the midnight deadline should should be the deadline it should be the deadline now we've been hearing this all day we've been hitting refresh on our computers and looking at these court documents uh, looking for pacers what we're looking at this is the system in which we will find out how many pages are about to be released we have been told that this could happen up until midnight end of day and, and you're right ashley we had heard that it was going to happen right after january 1st so here we are first business day of 2024 and we've been expecting it all day and then there was this thing that happened earlier today where we found out that one of the jane does in this case who had basically begged the judge not to release her name, uh, got her wish granted, and she's got until January 22nd. Can I ask you something about that? Yeah. I kept thinking that it was a really prominent American. And then there was this little bit of language that made mm. me start, it sort of threw the, the boomerang in there, right? Through right. a monkey wrench. I'm, a, I'm worried about my home country. There's something like that, right? Yes. Some language about my home country and the reaction. That she's in danger. What does that mean? I is it a know. clue or is it a, are they trying to throw us off? It is an American and they don't right. want us to know where they are. It could certainly be an American. It could be somebody who's afraid of being in their home country, being USA sure. and having the repercussions here. But it, she, the, whoever this person is said that she is worried if her name comes out, that she will face physical danger. And the judge said, all right, you've got until January 22nd to tell me more about this and also to provide this hate mail that you've told me about in court filings. So you've got until then, and then we'll talk about releasing your name. But is that the reason why we don't have the entirety of the document, question number one? Yeah. Um, or is it just about this one woman, and are we going to see the rest of the document released before midnight? That is what we are waiting for, and that is what we're monitoring. So the woman in question, we don't have any reason to believe that she's some co-conspirator. She'd have been charged by now. Right. And it's very important to note that everybody that on this list is not charged criminally. There's nothing because everybody that is law enforcement knows these names, right? We don't know the names, but they, they do. Them. Right. They've so, known them for years. So they, and they have said, and every legal expert that we've interviewed today said, look, it's important to note nobody on this list. So you're going to see a name. Nobody wants to have you know that association. Social media is going to do to That's them. right. That's right. They're going to tear them a new one. Even if there is, they could be victims and they're probably going to get ripped in That's social right. media. That's I right. I can see maybe why the judge has been a bit you know, uh, hesitant, but why is it being released? Is there, I mean, is it just, uh, it's just transparency and jurisprudence or has there been some kind of an action whereby it's being, the judge's hand is being forced? Well, it's just basically the judge saying, look, it has gone on long enough. And it was really a five-year legal battle with the Miami Herald that has been trying to get all of these names released, saying this must be public record. The judge tried as long as she could uh, to keep it sealed, and she did. And this is about the defamation mm -hmm. lawsuit uh, that went on in 2016. Um, right, well, that, was, that, that was Virginia Giuffre. She sued Ghislaine right. Maxwell for defamation. And that's where these names are coming from. They're all in that. That's yeah. right. And so last month, December 2023, the judge said, all right, this is enough. This is enough. So we're going to release it right after January 1st. And that's what we're waiting for. Oh, and we've got until midnight. Why only a woman? Like, why is there only a woman who's pushing to have, you know, her name? What about all the men? Like, well, there's nobody scared or worried enough to do the same thing. That's right. <laughs> I thought we'd have like <laughs> 40 or 50 men freaking out and, and filing civil suit. Well, that's one of the things that we're hearing from the inside of the court, that there could be other people, John and Jane Doe's, that are asking for their names not to be released and filing paperwork to that effect. So that's yeah. what we're going to wait and find out. I thought there'd be a whole bunch of the... Will you stay, by the way? Because like, of course. I'm looking at the clock. Now we're, what, one hour and 52 minutes to countdown? So That's right. So if it drops, you got like 10 people all lined up to go through the docks, right? We do. Okay, we have so a team of people ready to go. Yeah, full service over here. Uh, Laura Engel, thank you. We're going to come to you a little bit later. Thank you for that. Also, big story that we've been following. This one, um, for the first time since 2015, when she and her boyfriend conspired to murder her mother... That young lady, Gypsy Rose Blanchard, is a free woman. But then again, considering who her mother was, Gypsy Rose may actually be free for the very first time in her entire life. She actually was able to walk out of the Missouri prison last Thursday after eight years there, age 32 years old now, and she's just, like, starting a whole new life. Whole new chapter, whole new life on her own. Uh, she has obviously long been pretty scarred by, like, mental illness, horrific abuse, a lifelong of con. 
con that was spearheaded by her mom, Dee Dee Blanchard, right there in the picture, wearing the pretty blue dress. From Gypsy's earliest childhood, Dee Dee, that loving mom, would basically tell anybody who would listen that her little girl was desperately ill, basically on the verge of death, paralyzed by muscular dystrophy, dying of leukemia, racked by asthma, epilepsy. I don't have enough oxygen to go through the whole gamut. That's just a few. But she fed Gypsy Rose with a feeding tube, and she kept her in a wheelchair for 14 years, even though Gypsy Rose could walk. Terrified the kid, don't get up. She also uh, kept her in the spotlight. And then Dee Dee happily collected all the money that came because of that, and all the trips, and the brand new house that was donated by well-wishers for that sick little girl of hers. But the truth was Gypsy Rose was not afflicted by anything. None of those illnesses, none of those conditions. Her mother, on the other hand, had a pretty serious condition. Um, it's believed that she suffered from Munchausen by proxy syndrome, basically reveling in all the attention and sympathy that she craved as a caregiver of her little girl, her sick, sick little girl. And all of it came to an end in 2015. And if you know the story, you know what happened. If you don't know the story, pour a drink. Gypsy Rose decided that she'd had enough. She'd had enough of the lies, mother's control, the pain, the suffering, the unnecessary medical tests. So she cooked up a plan with her boyfriend at the time to kill mom, just to go ahead and do it, just kill Dee Dee Blanchard. And in June of that same year, the boyfriend went ahead and did just that, just took the boots to her, killed her mom, while Gypsy was just a few rooms over in the bathroom, just covering her ears so she didn't have to hear all the screaming. So obviously it was not well executed. It was a dumb crime, left clues everywhere. And both of them were caught. Both of them were tried. The boyfriend was sent to prison for life, no parole. Gypsy Rose was not. Gypsy Rose was sent for 10 years with the right to parole. And she served eight and she's now free. And she's starting a brand new life with a brand new husband. Somebody she married while she was actually behind bars and he wasn't. I want you to check out her New Year's Eve message that she sent out on social media. Hey everyone, happy New Year's Eve. Um, I'm about to celebrate with my family. Um, I have my dad and my stepmom Christy here and of course my husband. Um, so we're looking to bring in the New Year together. It's gonna be really awesome to have some family time after so long. So to everyone watching, happy New Year's Eve. Bye. New Year's Eve. That was TikTok. And in case you are keeping track, Gypsy Rose already has almost 6 million followers on Instagram. That was her TikTok. She's got 6 million over on Instagram. Paparazzi are already following her every move and snapping shots of her while she's out shopping for the shoes that she wanted on the day that she was released. But she is starting to tell her story, and she actually started a while ago. Uh, she started to tell her lifelong saga before she left prison. In a 2017 documentary called Mommy, Dead, and Dearest, she talked about not understanding how and how much she was being abused. Yes, very, very good. I really didn't think any abuse was going on. Um, it's like when you're abused, but you live that way your whole life. You don't really know that you're being abused. You don't know any different. Looking at the open ocean now. And it's beautiful. I knew that I was different, or my life was different from other kids, but people thought of us as, you know, the sweetest mother-daughter family ever the best two people in the world. So uh, it, the word is called parasite. And if you don't know parasite, Latin stem, it's killing one's parent. And it is pretty damn rare. It's not unheard of, but it is very rare. Actually, just last Wednesday, a 14-year-old um, in California, a boy there was arrested for allegedly murdering both of his parents and also, you know, attacked his sister. Um, in 1998... It was a 15-year-old who suffered from delusions and paranoia and killed his parents before opening fire at his school cafeteria. And of course, you know, one of the most famous cases of parasite, the Menendez brothers. 
They were convicted of murdering both their parents after what they say was just years and years of abuse. If you don't know this, they are represented now by Mark Garagos, who is a renowned defense attorney and also a good friend of mine and a good friend of the program. And what do you know? He's live right there. Um, so you're perfect for this, Mark, because we're talking about um, a young woman who killed her parents or killed her mother and said, I had good reason. And for the most part, I, I think the majority of people really believe that and believe that, that Gypsy Rose was a victim. I just wanted to get your take on justice, you know, when it comes to the Gypsy Rose story. You know, the, and hi, Ashley, Happy New Year. Uh, the, you know, my uh, erstwhile podcast partner, Adam Carolla, does a bit with the Menendez brothers that um, it really speaks truth and could be used here. If you're sitting on your couch on a Sunday evening eating ice cream with your wife and your kids come in and uh, blow you away, uh, it either speaks to awful parenting or you've done something horribly, horribly, horribly awful to them. And when you take a look at what your package just was uh, about about this young lady and some of the kind of the background of it, it's astonishing to me that she served as much time as she did and that she wasn't released sooner. I mean, it's a, a God forbid that anybody should be in that. And, and the the kind of psychological assessment, and, and this speaks to both the Menendez case and this case, there is a uh, there is a psychological coping mechanism that that tries to take place in a post traumatic syndrome that sets in such that the threat becomes real ever present and omnipresent and so it's something that's real for those who say why don't you just run away why don't you do this i've heard all of those things yeah, that's an absolute kind of blackout or repression yourself so, the psychological damage can i push back here and listen i feel for this kid i feel for gypsy rose uh, i have researched this story and it sickens me I feel like she's a victim uh, first, but she's also a perpetrator. And I'm always so concerned about extra judicial vigilantism. You just can't go kill someone because you've been victimized by them. That's just the way we are. But how do you reconcile these, these two truths? Well, I think it's the law does, except the law has, you know, if you have a homicide, which is the killing of another at the hands of somebody. You then have to say, is it a murder or a manslaughter? And what's the difference? Ashley knows. It's malice. It's your state of mind. Nobody's saying that you get a free pass to kill somebody. What they're saying is you're not guilty of murder. You didn't have the malice. It was an imperfect self-defense. It was you were under the throes of a psychological malady that was inflicted on you and you did what you thought you had to do. By the way, the whole advent in the 90s, and I tried some of these cases back then, of battered woman syndrome and this idea that somehow a woman could just leave, that she that if she had a husband who was um, battering her, that she could just leave. She didn't need to do it. We debunked that almost 50 years ago, 40 years ago. But we haven't in other areas when it comes to children. fathers yeah. and sons. No, you're right. and children. We a, haven't gotten to that. It's a yet. great point. Can I ask you one other thing? It's sort of, it's different from the, you know, the justice aspect. But it is about the followers and the life story and the payments for documentaries, etc., uh, that's a whole other sort of set, set of ethics. And she's got 6 million followers on Insta. I haven't counted TikTok lately, but I'm sure it's pretty pretty uh, robust. What are your thoughts about just the aspect of someone who's been through a criminal justice process, um, has, has done his or her time, paid dues? Should they then be able to profit? Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially in a case where the culture was not catching up to the, the, or the law was not catching up to the culture, because that's generally what happens, whether it's the Menendez case, whether it's this case, whether it's other cases where at the time we believed fervently one thing or we believed in law and order for a particular reason or in a particular milieu. Yes, once you've done your time, why not? I don't, I, uh, that's part of the way you integrate in. It's part of the way that you redeem yourself in, in some, uh, some ways. And I think it's 
it's perfectly fine and should be the case. I always love your take. It's why I keep asking you back. And since we were talking about the Menendez kids, I'm going to call you later this week to get an update. And then you'll be back again, hopefully, too. Um, Happy New Year, Mark. It's good to see you. Happy New Year. Love seeing you, Ashley. Bye-bye. Cheers. Okay, still to come. Um, I'm kind of done with the whole I'm on a diet for the New Year's resolutions. So let's just talk about New Year's regrets. How about that? Because I kind of think the prosecutors in the Brian Koberger case might be dealing with some New Year's regrets. My opinion, but I'm not the only one. It's because they signed off on a huge decision that could now affect how the trial plays out. I'm going to tell you about that along with some very, very happy happy news for one of the victim's family members. And then, of course, as we started off the top of the show, we're still waiting on those Epstein documents to drop. I'm looking at the clock. One hour, 40 minutes on the countdown. That's what time it is till midnight. Laura Engel's still working on it. She's standing by next. Easy. You know, just to wipe away the horrors of a quadruple murder. It's not. Uh, But last week, a demolition crew ripped down the house at 1122 King Road in Moscow, Idaho. And that basically ends forever, that painful debate over whether the biggest piece of evidence in one of the biggest murder cases in memory should be preserved for trial. It ain't. It won't be. It's gone. The University of Idaho, which owns the property, said that taking that thing down was absolutely necessary was necessary for the kids, the school, the community. Everybody needed to heal. But there were a lot of other people who did not agree, including the families, many of them, not all of them, families of the victims who died there. Um, They're left wondering at this point, what if the state, what if the defense even, ever needs to go back there for another perspective or maybe another piece of evidence? Can't now. What if the jury just wants to see the house in person to fully understand How it all happened that night. Can't do that now. Last year alone, jurors in two high-profile murder cases visited crime scenes. Uh, It was back in March that the Alex Murdoch jury decided to go to Moselle because they wanted to see where Paul and Maggie Murdoch were gunned down. And then in August, the jurors in the Parkland, Florida school shooting, they, they went to the high school where 17 kids, students and staff members, were killed in 2018. So, uh, with that in mind, I want to bring in News Nation senior national correspondent, Brian Enton. He spent weeks and weeks and weeks outside that home. I'm, I can't imagine it not being there, for starters. It's sort of an eerie thought, yeah. you know? It's weird to think that it's just a big, empty lot now, mm. especially just visually seeing it in my head, because it's in between all these other apartment buildings. It's so it's, iconic, I mean, at this point. Yeah. So, um, you have broken some really fascinating news. This is something I've never heard happen in a criminal case with evidence, but tell me what they did with the uh, rubble. Yeah, so after the demolition, we've learned they were really, really concerned about people coming and trying to figure out where the pieces of the house were taken and and actually trying to, like, get a piece of the house, which is super freaky and weird to even imagine someone would want to do that. But But, but they do. They do. Crime souvenirs. Then they, like, sell it on eBay and stuff. It's it's super, it's gross. But uh, they were ready for that. So what they did is they took all of the pieces of the house after the demolition to a solid waste facility not far away where they had dug a massive hole feet and feet and feet beneath the earth. They put everything in the hole and it has already been covered up. Uh, so they're hoping that is a way that they can be sure that no one will do that. Because I remember, I don't even remember what month, but I remember sometime last year there was grave concern about the process, right? Like we've got to have it, uh, we've got to have screened areas, we've got to have chain link fences up because we just can't have people coming in while the house is coming down and grabbing pieces of that sort of macabre memory. Yeah, and they had a whole set up this time. I mean, they had a media area that people weren't allowed on the the street right in front of the house. They started very early. That was the thing that surprised me the most about the whole thing was they started tearing the house down before the sun came up, Mm -hmm. and most of the house was down, probably about half, uh, like right as the sun was rising. Did you just ask our producers, do we have sound on this video, by the way, that's playing beside Brian? Is there sound that we can just turn up on it? I'm just, I'm always curious to sort of be transported to 
I think it's silent. Is, is part of the problem they just kept us so far away that we just couldn't sort of be there and be documenting this close up? I mean, I, I remember them saying they were going to block off every street. He had no access to get near it. Yeah, I mean, there was a, an area next to the house where the cameras could be. It, it wasn't that far away. Um, I think it's just weird to watch it come down at this state of things. Like, if everything was over... Maybe it'd almost be like a relief people I think you're seeing right. it. There you are. Yeah, but it's because it, it's so un, like everything is still so unsettled. not unsettled. Yeah. Like it doesn't feel right right now. No, I, I'm with you, and I know that Steve Gonzalez and uh, three of the the victims' family members all, all feel the same way. Um, you know, Ethan Chapin's parents don't feel that way. They're, they've got kids that are still there. They have two of the triplets that are, yeah. that are still there. Can you just tell me the really good news about the Gonzalez family and what? Yes, happened? Olivia had another baby. Uh, mm-hmm. Olivia Gonzalez, Kaylee's sister, December 29th, which is your birthday, by the way. Yay, happy birthday. Yeah, so That's you guys so share a birthday. Um, but yeah, it's really, you know, it's nice to see cause with everything that they've been through. And I, I know that brings them brings them joy. They, they were in such need of joy. So this is sort of the second injection of joy, her second baby. Yeah. Uh, I'm very happy for them. I'm glad you could bring that news. And thank you for um, finding out that extraordinary detail. Yeah, it's just a sad state of our... I mean, it's kind of weird that they had to go to those extremes, but it, it just shows the it world is, we live right? in. It yeah. is. It's really odd. Um, Brian, you're the greatest. Thank you are, happy too. Happy New it's Year. It's always nice to see you. Love to see you, too. Happy Thank New you Year. For that. All right, still to come. So would you stay calm if somebody hooked you up to a lie detector test and then started asking you questions that were possibly the most important questions of your life? Personally, I would pass, because I am not 100% sure on that science. But I am also not Casey Anthony's mom or Casey Anthony's dad who have been repeatedly called liars about the death of their granddaughter, Kaylee. So they decided, hell yes, we'll hook up to a lie detector and we will take that test and we'll do you one more. We'll take it on TV. And their answers are just starting to leak out and we have a sneak peek. Coming at you right after this break. What's next? I don't know if you ever do this. Um, and maybe it's just because I work in the business of true crime, but um, I actually picture Kaylee Anthony today. I imagine her at like 18 years old because my son is 18 also. Um, I imagine her celebrating Christmas and like New Year's and maybe she's a senior in high school and thinking about prom. Uh, she's probably, she, if she were alive right now, she'd be doing her college apps because my kid's doing that. But we are never going to know about that because Kaylee never made it out of childhood. And we just marked 15 years since that little girl's body was found decomposing in the woods near her home. The prosecutors tried like hell to to send her mom, Kaylee, Casey, Casey Anthony. Uh, They tried everything to send her to death row, but it didn't work. And the jury acquitted her of murder anyway. And Casey Anthony walked out of the courtroom. Little Kaylee's homicide effectively today is an unsolved case this many years later. But what about George and Cindy Anthony? Casey's parents, Kaylee's grandparents. Because the questions have swirled on and on for 15 years about whether they were somehow involved in either little Kaylee's disappearance or death, as Casey suggested, and as her lawyer outright claimed at her trial. Casey has also accused her father, George, of abusing her sexually and otherwise. And so George and Cindy Anthony are hitting these accusations head on. And they have agreed to take polygraph tests on camera. And the tests are about to be aired on the A&E network later this week. Take a look. Oh, yeah. This is really hard, especially when you know that I never got a chance to see my granddaughter again. He knows how important it is. If you have anything to do with Kaylee's disappearance, then the polygraph's going to show that. Is there a kernel of truth to any of the allegations she's leveling against you? Did you ever have sexual contact with Casey? Is your marriage going to survive this? Did you knowingly conceal Kaylee's whereabouts? Did I conceal her whereabouts? Did you conceal her whereabouts? Casey Anthony's Parents, The Lie Detector Test, premieres Thursday, January 4th at 9. Well, it's dramatic, that's for sure. I have my thoughts about this, by the way. It was a little more than a year ago that uh, Casey gave the first interview since her trial, and she made those shocking accusations about her father, George, that she saw him holding Kaylee's body, 
that uh, he didn't try to resuscitate the grandchild that he adored. Um, he didn't call 911 for the grandchild he adored. Um, and that uh, he knew all along where that little girl's remains were for the whole six months. I think you get where I'm coming from. I have feelings and thoughts about this. But let, re, uh, let me remind you what Casey Anthony said in her own words in the Peacock interview that she gave in 2022. She basically lays the blame for Kaylee's death fully on her father's shoulders. I can see him standing there with her in his arms and hand her to me and telling me that it's my fault that I did that, that I caused that. And I just collapsed with her in my arms. She was heavy, she was cold. But as I'm sitting there with her on my lap, just hysterical, but just staring at her, not knowing what to do. He takes her from me and he immediately softens his tone and tells me it's going to be okay. That she was going to be okay. That's what he said to me. Okay, well, I have a problem. <laughs> I have a lot of problems. Because you're a liar. You know, Casey... All you do is lie. It's all you've ever done, and you are exquisite at it. So, I don't know. I don't believe you, ever. I, I, I don't even believe if you could tell the truth that I believe it was the truth. I want to show you another clip from the special. Again, it's called Casey Anthony's Parents, The Lie Detector Test. It's on Peacock. And this is the part of the test where George Anthony is asked, did you knowingly conceal Kaylee's whereabouts? been married to Cindy now for how long? 42 years. Congratulations. You have never cheated on, on Cindy, have you? Even an, even an emotional affair, right? I haven't. Okay. I have not. All right. Uh, have you always been a 10 on the sexual integrity scale? No. Yes. 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 No. I guess when you're separated, it doesn't um. count. I don't know. Did you knowingly conceal Kaylee's whereabouts? No. I mean, I, I didn't know where she was at. Correct. That's all I'm asking. So the question again, did you knowingly conceal Kaylee's whereabouts? No. Okay, so you're struggling with that one a little bit. Tell me why. I mean, it's because I, I it was so close to our house. Yeah. That she was found. Right. Um, but think about the times you went out looking for her. Yes. Did you know where she was that whole time? No. You sure? I, I, I didn't know where she was at. Okay, that's all I'm asking you. I did not know. That's all I'm asking you. Okay, George? You kind of pull it together. I just was visualizing the, the woods at the moment. I'm sorry. You, the what? The woods where she was found. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay, you're going to have to compartmentalize right now. Okay. As you sit here right now, Hello. did you conceal her whereabouts? Did I conceal her whereabouts? I, I did not know where she was at. Okay, so why are you struggling with that? Oh, man. No, I'm watching. I said Peacock, by the way, that's A&E. Uh, the other one was on Peacock. This one's on A&E. But that question, you know, did you conceal Kaylee's whereabouts? It's a, it's a simple yes or no question. Polygraph expert also asked George about Casey's claims that he sexually abused her. And the special also goes on to show the two grandparents both reacting to each other's answers in real time while each of them is hooked up to the polygraph. So we're going to see it all later this week. Uh, again, Casey Anthony's parents, the lie detector test on a and &E. I said before Peacock, it's on a and &E. And I'm going to have lots to say after it airs, so stay tuned. Uh, but still to come in this show tonight... The movie that we did not, or the move that we did not see coming, uh, in the sex, money, and equestrian murder for hire in California, the woman who took out a two million dollar contract on her husband has finally come clean. And wait until you hear about the pile of manure that she's about to step in with those beautiful booties. Next. So 
by my count, we're about an hour and 13 minutes away from today's deadline, which is the Jeffrey Epstein Little Black Book documents drop. They're supposed to do it before midnight tonight. I always know they sneak them in there. So um, Laura Ingalls still refreshing the page, and she's going to stand by and jump in anytime that, uh, that drops. So you're not going to miss it. Not on my watch. But can I just say that I never, ever want to hear again how slow the news is during the holidays? Because it ain't. So far tonight, we've reported on Gypsy Rose Blanchard getting out of prison and then also the site of the Idaho student murders being demolished, not just in the same holiday week, but on the very same day. And I'm not even done yet, because do you remember and how could you not? (laughs) Tatiana Rembley. Uh, Tatiana Rembley is the equestrian siren who was accused of hiring a hitman to kill her husband, Mark. Uh, He was the same millionaire husband who bankrolled Basically, her every desire, up and to and including this whole Cirque du Soleil horsey show uh, that she wanted to star in, and it was a total flop. This is the same husband who appeared alongside her in that very strange reality TV show called Naked Sanctum. You can't forget, because look at that. You, You can't forget pictures like this. She, that one right there, who had it all, put out a $2 million hit on her husband, and she was busted at a Starbucks after bringing three guns and a stack of money as a down payment. Uh, The problem for her was that the hitman at the Starbucks was actually an undercover cop. Dang, cuffs on, jail time, no bail, and she denied everything, like everything, right up until she didn't, which was last Thursday. And that's when she, like out of the blue, made a deal with the prosecutors that was probably pretty hard for her to swallow. She pleaded guilty to solicitation to commit murder. And she was sentenced to three years and eight months in prison. What? Joining me now is Dave Ehrenberg. He makes deals like that because he's the state attorney (laughs) for Palm Beach County in Florida. Wow. So are those just really, really good uh, district attorneys, uh, attorneys? Or did they just basically have her over a barrel? And I'm sorry for all this, like, imagery. Good to be with you and Happy New Year, Ashley. You too. I wonder how the victim felt about it. I assume the prosecutors went to him and got his approval for this deal. Because when you take a deal like this early on, that's when you can get a good deal where it's fewer than four years in prison. I had a case very similar to this in the Dahlia DiPolito case. I remember it. Yes, very similar. She was a stripper and she tried to have her husband of like two weeks killed uh, through a hitman, and it wasn't video, a hitman, it was an undercover oh, cop. Yeah. Dave, the video of her was just delicious. I mean, the, the whole thing, they, they pretended it all, and then they even pretended to tell her about it on camera, and she had to act like she was upset. It was an incredible uh, case. Exactly. Great recall, Ashley. Right. And that case, after she was found guilty the first time, it was overturned on appeal, and then a second time, it was a hung jury. We had to do it three times, yeah. and after she was convicted a third time, she got 16, won six years in prison. So the fact that this defendant got almost four years without a single trial is really not that bad, as long as the victim approved of the deal. So good question, because I always wonder if you're a great state attorney, but I always wonder if every state attorney does that, has the respect of the victim to get the buy-in, because it's not mandatory, it's just ethical. Correct. You have to listen to the victim, let their voice be heard. But it's your decision because you don't represent the victim in court. Uh, You're not his client, his lawyer. You represent the people of the community, of the state. And here in the interest of justice, someone with no prior criminal record, someone who took a plea early on before a single trial, and perhaps someone who had the approval of the victim just to settle this thing, could get a sentence way below what she would have received if she went to trial. So although it is on the light side, it's not unheard of. Yeah, I think she should be so lucky, honestly, uh, with a scheme like that. And by the way, two million. We've seen hits for like 50 bucks. (laughs) She's not very smart. She's not very thrifty with her money, shall we say. And she's not going to have any of that anymore. Hey, Dave, happy new year. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, Ashley. Happy New Year. We'll have you back again early and often. But still to come on this program, um, in the Sharknado movies, Ian Ziering regularly fought off swarms of angry sharks. But in real life, it was bikers. He had to contend with bikers and a lot of them. We're going to show you how this brawl started, how it ended, and what the police plan to do about it now. And also, 
what he had to do for his daughter. She saw all of this. Adopt U.S. Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting A Teenager Learning the Lingo GOAT, G-O-A-T Acronym Stands for Greatest of All Time As in Spaghetti sandwiches for dinner? They're my fave Dad, you're the GOAT You don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same Visit AdoptUSKids.org Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Adopt U.S. Kids and the Ad Council This is an important message from the Mine Safety and Health Administration. Mining fatalities, accidents, and injuries are preventable. Taking a minute to approach your task safely can protect you and your fellow miners from injury and death. Staying alert and focused can keep you safe. Do it safe. Do it right. Whether buckling a seatbelt or securing equipment, these quick safety measures can prevent injuries and fatalities. Take time. Save lives. For more resources, visit MSHA.gov. Grandpa, look what I got. Wait till you see the bike we got for Jake. It is the coolest thing. Hearing loss happens gradually with age, making it easy to ignore. Yet most older Americans aren't getting their hearing tested. Dad, can you hear me? Untreated hearing loss can keep your loved ones from enjoying what they cherish most. Don't let that happen. Speak up about hearing loss. You'll be glad you did. Brought to you by the American Speech Language Hearing Association. Many Americans have missed regular dental care in the past few years. It's important to see a dentist twice a year to identify any problems early. Taking care of your oral health helps overall health. Brushing at least twice a day with fluoride toothpaste and flossing daily can help prevent oral health problems. For more information, visit hrsa.gov slash oral dash health. When it comes to a gun suicide attempt, all it takes is a moment. My son, Ricky, took his life by the use of a firearm. It broke me, and I contemplated suicide. My grandson, I was going to have to be here for him. I still own my firearm. I keep it in a safe because I want to keep my grandson and myself safe. Store your guns, locked, unloaded, and away from ammo. Hear more safe stories at endfamilyfire.org. Brought to you by Brady and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Dr. Kathleen Eubanks-Ming with the American Academy of Family Physicians. Bullies use power, strength, or popularity to hurt others emotionally or physically. And while you can't be with your child all the time, there are ways you can help. If your child encounters a bully, tell them to get to a safe place and tell an adult. You can also show them how to block online bullies. Teach them they can be more than a bystander and that they can help their peers. For more on bullying, visit FamilyDoctor.org or talk with your family physician. You're listening to News Nation. To get America's fastest growing news channel on your screen, go to JoinNN.com. Want to get out of just about anything and look like an earth-saving hero? Just use the environment excuse. High school reunion? Sorry, can't. Planetary obligations. Unfortunate bridesmaid's dress? Unfortunately, you promised the climate you'd buy more vintage. Chauffeuring teens? The earth really needs them to hoof it. The environment is always the best excuse. Find your out and opt in to cutting carbon. Just visit theenvironmentexcuse.org. Brought to you by Wild Aid. I need some extra money. Do I qualify for the earned income tax credit? Use the EITC Assistant Tool. With just a little information, this tool helps you calculate eligibility with ease and accuracy. Get an estimate of how much credit you qualify for and get a printout of your results before you prepare your return or visit your tax preparer. To use the EITC Assistant Tool and see if you're eligible to claim a credit, visit irs.gov EITC. We are the Veterans Health Administration, and our hands provide life-changing care to over 9 million veterans across more than 1,200 facilities nationwide. Join hands with us to make an impact in your community. Learn more at vacareers.va.gov. On the show, Beverly Hills 90210, that uh, Ian Ziering, that's the actor, played this wisecracking trust fund baby. Take a look. But in real life, he 
he actually turned out to have some serious cred and actually can handle himself in a street fight. Because on New Year's Eve, Ian Ziering was, like, dealing with this. He was attacked by a group of L.A. mini-bikers. I know, I'd never heard of mini-bikers either, but here they are. Uh, they were all driving down Hollywood Boulevard. And you can see this video is, uh, is done. Is, we got it from TMZ, kind enough to let us show it. You can see he's, like, he got out of his vehicle... And he was confronting the, one of the mini bike drivers. And then they just all suddenly gang up on him and just like take the booth to him. And look how serious this is. Nasty. Take a look. Okay, so here is the part I'm quite upset with. Um, after that whole crazy brawl, Z- here he is, Zeering, oh, cr- you know, he's there confronting his, or con- comforting, actually, his, his 12-year-old girl, his daughter. I think her name is Mia or Maya. Uh, she was in the car with him when all this happened. So she witnessed all of this. She sees her dad getting, like, beat to a pulp on the street. We don't really know at this point what started the fight, but there are some witnesses who were there who said that the bikers, the many bikers, have been causing chaos like this for weeks. They've been weaving in and out of traffic and, you know, just basically being a-holes. Um, so in the police report, actually, Ian Ziering is listed as a victim in all of this. And the actor himself released a statement about the incident, and I'm going to read it in part. It says, while stuck in traffic, my car was approached aggressively by one of these riders, leading to an unsettling confrontation. In an attempt to assess any damage, I exited my car. This action unfortunately escalated into a physical altercation, which I navigated to protect myself. Ziering says neither he nor his daughter uh, was hurt in all of this, uh, but he is concerned about the growing brazenness of these groups. And the LAPD says it's investigating the incident, although um, so far they don't have any arrests, but I can identify some of them and I can see some license plates too. So let's hope. That is all for tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Happy New Year. Cuomo's next. everybody, welcome to 2024. I'm Brian Enton sitting in for Chris Cuomo tonight. We are live and we have a packed show. It was a stressful New Year's for nearly 200 of Jeffrey Epstein's friends and associates because at, at any moment, and literally it could happen at any moment during the show, the sealed court documents are revealing their names could be released. This weekend, uh, we heard former President Bill Clinton will be on that list. It could also include other prominent names like Donald Trump, Bill Gates, Prince Andrew, the list goes on and on. And tonight we will speak to someone who may be on that list himself, Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz. Does he want this list revealed? And why might his name be on the list? 